Good evening. Our first reading is from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 10. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good evening. Our second reading tonight is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, which starts with the word, therefore. Lachen, in the Hebrew language. When you say lachen, it means because of everything else I just told you. Therefore, listen up. He just told them about faith. He told them about Abraham, about Moses, about Isaac, about the judges. He told them about the walls of Jericho. He told them about those who conquered kingdoms, those who subdued nations, who worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions. Therefore, he says, chapter 12, verse 1, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons, saying, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. This is the word of the Lord. The gospel reading is found in Luke chapter 15. Please stand. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. 
But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, good evening. Such a privilege to be here with you folks again. Um, I do love all of the saints around the world, but I love you more. I am biased. Um, well, let me introduce myself to you. Uh, my name is Matthew. Um, I have the privilege of directing a Bible college here in Jerusalem. It's called Calvary Chapel. Um, I also have the privilege of um, sharing with the music team on Sunday nights. And uh, listen, I, I want you to know something about them, that um, they're not just beautiful voices, uh, they are most certainly beautiful souls as well. I mean, they are, really are the real deal, and I appreciate the privilege of singing with them. Um, you know, they say that uh, the humble musician is an oxymoron, um, but not with these, these fine folks. Um, so they, they love the Lord and they love you, and it's been really a privilege to, to sing here and to be with you all over the last couple years. Um, I come from California. Uh, I know many of you are saying sorry about that. Um, after last service in the morning, uh, somebody came up to me and said something like, is there anything good that comes out of California? Uh, the answer is tacos. That's it. Yeah, tacos. Um, you know what, my, uh, my denomination, and, and we call it a movement, but it, it is a denomination, it's called Calvary Chapel. It came out of um, what we call revival. Um, and the revival that happened was in the 60s and 70s um, with the hippies there in California. And, and many of them came to know the Lord in a very powerful way, uh, along with my parents. And I am a, a byproduct of that. And so I kind of saw the tail end of revival and I saw uh, so many that were going to church almost every day of the week and I saw healing and I saw um, people coming to the Lord being delivered from you know alcoholism and uh, abuse and all of these sorts of things um, and then I, I had my own personal revival in 1999 where I came to know the Lord um, because even though you can grow up in a Christian home that um, you need to come to know the Lord in a personal way, and that was most certainly um, for myself. So um, this morning, uh, we are uh, in um, uh, different chapters of the Bible. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, repentance and um, God's heart towards us for the wayward believer. Now, our story really begins in 2 Samuel chapter 11 with a man named King David. And King David was known as a man after God's own heart, um, but he has a, this blemish in his life. He has a fall in his life. And I'm so thankful that the Bible records this because it tells me this really is the Word of God. Because if man wrote it, they would 
conveniently leave this stuff out. And so God leaves it in because he wants to show us um, who he is and who man is and also the redemption that follows. And so it says in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel that uh, in the springtime when uh, kings were to go to war, that David stayed back and he let Joab go and fight the battle. And I want you to know something tonight that it's a very dangerous thing when we are called to fight and we stay back. There's a time for peace. There's a time for rest. There's a time for a sweet vacation. But God calls us to spiritual battle. And when it's time to fight that we need to fight and we can get into a lot of trouble when we just take luxuries when it's time to fight. And so it says that David, in the evening that he went to the, his rooftop. And as he was up there, and in, in my mind, it probably wasn't the first time that he was up there and he saw something he shouldn't have seen. But he looked down and he saw a beautiful woman bathing by the name of Bathsheba. And he, he says, you know what, who is this woman? Bring her here. And they say, hey, isn't this Bathsheba, Uriah's wife? And what I find is that before a fall is that God will come and he will warn us before we fall. We need to take heed to that. Take heed to the warnings of God in our life. But at this point in his life, maybe overcome with the flesh, he sends for her anyway. Now, why is that? Up until this point, David has been multiplying wives in his life, something that was strictly forbidden God had mentioned it in Deuteronomy 17. He says, for the kings of Israel, you are not to multiply wives, but yet David did it. And so what I find in life is that we don't just fall into sin. We kind of slip into sin and then we have a fall. And so David had been transgressing. David had already been compromising in his life. And when he sees Bathsheba bathing and they say, hey, look, she's a married woman, he sends for her anyway. So Bathsheba comes to the king, and they end up having a sexual relationship together. Sends her away, she has her, you know, time of purity, but she gives notice back to the king, I'm with child, I'm pregnant. You imagine hearing that news, you've already sinned, and now you see some of the repercussions of that sin. Bathsheba is pregnant, a married woman is pregnant. So says, okay, what am I going to do? So he comes up with a plan. Have Uriah come back home. Have him come off the battlefield and, and kind of get some relaxation. Because if he can go and have sexual relationships with his wife, then maybe, you know, he would think that the child belongs to him. So he brings Uriah back. Maybe some niceties. Uriah, how are you doing? How was the battle? How are the men? Okay, listen, just go enjoy your time with your wife. But it says that Uriah didn't go home. Instead, he camped out. He slept with the king's servants by the house of the king's palace. So David hears about it. Okay, what am I going to do? Plan A didn't work. Plan B, I'll get him drunk. So he brings him over the next night, feeds him, gives him plenty to drink. You know, maybe the wine is coming down in the glass, tops him off a little bit. Oh, I'll keep drinking. And eventually, hey, listen, you had a hard night. You've had a, a, you know, a hard couple of months. Go home and just enjoy your wife. But again, Uriah the Hittite doesn't go back. For why should he have to, uh, or why should he go home and enjoy the pleasures of his wife when the Ark of the Covenant is gone and his, his men are still at war? And so plan B doesn't work. So what does he do? Probably in a frantic, just in a, in, in a panic, he has the last option. He writes a letter to Joab and he says something like, Joab, I want you to send Uriah the Hittite into the hottest part of the battle where the most valiant men are. And when the battle is at its peak, I want you to, to withdraw and let Uriah the Hittite die. And guess what? He handed that letter to Uriah knowing that he wouldn't read that letter. That's the kind of character that Uriah had. And he sent him off, sealed his fate, 
And so Joab reads the letter and he does, he obeys the order of the king, sends Uriah into battle, withdraws from him when things get hot, and Uriah the Hittite dies. So Joab sends word back, Uriah has died. And what does David do? Does he grieve? Does he mourn? Does he cry out to God? No. He takes Bathsheba to become his wife. So not only does he think that he has covered his sin in front of the people, but he looks and he comes off as the hero. And I want to say something to you guys. Um, You know, we can fool a lot of people. We can't fool God. He sees. He sees the secrets of our hearts. But he's also a God of redemption. And so time goes by, and like the character of our Lord that we serve, he sends Nathan the prophet. And Nathan comes in, he says, listen, David, I want to tell you a story. There were two men in the kingdom. One was very rich. He had much livestock. He literally had everything that he could possibly want in this life. And there was another man. He was poor. He had nothing except for one ewe lamb that he loved like a daughter. And it grew up with him. And it slept in the same bed as he did. He loved that ewe lamb. And one day a traveler came in. It says that 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 rich man wanting to be a good host Instead of taking from his own livestock, he took that ewe lamb, slaughtered it, and served it to his guest. And at this point in the story, David was very angry. And he said, that man shall surely die. And in my own head, I just kind of imagine that Nathan just took a step forward, looked him in the eye, and said, David, you are that man. Must have been like a spear entering into his heart because he was caught. And so David confesses his sins. He does ask for forgiveness. But Nathan the prophet said, but because of this, because you slept with Bathsheba, because you killed Uriah the Hittite, the sword shall never leave your house. And listen, saints, Every time that we confess to God, every time that we come to him and ask forgiveness, he will forgive us. But there are consequences to our sins. And it was just like taking a nail and nailing it into a wooden board. You can pull that nail out, but the hole is still there. And so we can suffer the consequences of sin, lasting consequences. So God is faithful. He will forgive us. So the title of this message is The Path to Repentance and God's Faithfulness to Bring Us Back. I jotted down a couple of notes. If you don't mind, I'm going to read them. What is our part in repentance? What is our part, our responsibility? Well, number one, our responsibility. When we transgress... We must acknowledge our sin before the Lord. I love Psalms 51. You see the heart of David. He says, for I am conscious of my error and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I done wrong, working that which is evil in your eyes so that your words may be seen to be right and you may may be clear when you are judging. Our part is simply to confess before the Lord. One of my favorite passages in all of the Bible is found in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It, typically, we call this the Christian bar of soap. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. We don't have to jump through hoops. We don't need to say Hail Mary 10 times. We don't need to like go do, you know, a backflip off of, you know, a jump. And look, we don't need to do anything but come to God and ask him for forgiveness for the things that we've done. And he's willing to forgive us. So our part is simply to ask for forgiveness. Number two, as far as our part towards repentance, we need to remember that there is lasting, sometimes, lasting 
consequences of sin in our life. It says, therefore, the, the sword shall never depart from thy house because thou hast despised me and hast taken down and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. You know, you think about how David lost f- uh, four of his children to the sword. Sometimes we just need to remember that there are consequences and that keeps us from going down a path to sin. You know, in Hebrew, we, we have a word. Um, it's, the word is acharit. It means the end of something. Sometimes in the Old Testament, it's translated destiny. It says in Lamentations that they did not consider their destiny, the end of the path that you're on. And so, friends, I want to ask you something because um, as my favorite writer would say, it, it's, uh, it would be a crime for me to teach God's word and not apply it to the listener. What path? are you on? What road are you going down? Where does it lead to? See, a wise man will stop and say, okay, this direction that I'm going on, it leads to something harmful. Or the path that I'm on to now is leading to everlasting life and to a life of fruitfulness. So sometimes it's good to consider our end, to consider the consequences for our sin. You know, I think about my, my son, who's 16 now, but when he was two years old, um, he was curious about everything. And as you know, those of you who are parents here tonight, at around two years old, uh, they start pushing the envelope on everything. They wanna knock the books down on the bookshelf. They think it's a good idea by putting a fork in the electrical socket. You know, anything that could harm them, they wanna do. And I remember one evening that we were having dinner with my family, and it was a candlelit dinner. And the, we had the one candle, and it was lighting up the room, and it was kind of a special thing, you know, just to be there with the kids. We had a newborn, a two-year-old, and a four-year-old, and we're, you know, we're praying together, we're worshiping together, we're eating together, and my two-year-old reaches out to touch the candle, because after all, it's shiny, it looks cool, and I need to touch it. So I said, don't. And then he stops a little bit. And just like most two-year-olds, they want to say, okay, what does don't mean? Do you really mean that? And so he begins to go in that direction again to touch the flame. So as any good father, I thought to myself, well, see how this thing plays out. (laughs) Now, before you call me a derelict father, I want you to know something. He did touch the candle and he did get burned, and he got hurt. But guess what? The next time that his father says, don't do that, he's going to listen. God will allow you to suffer the consequences simply because he loves you. Simply because he says, okay, look, you're not going to be destroyed by this thing. I'll let you. I said no. You did it anyway. And guess what? You got hurt. Now listen to me next time. And when I say don't touch the oven, guess what? He's not going to touch the oven. And when I say don't run into the street, he's not going to run into the street. We have a loving Father. So sometimes we suffer the consequences. It doesn't mean that God has abandoned us. It means He loves us. But we need to remember there are consequences, yes? Okay, let's move on. What is God's heart towards the way we're believing? What is God's heart? What does He think of us? Number one, first of all, He will always come for us when we wander off. He will always come for us when we wander off. He leaves the 99 and he goes for the one lost sheep. That's his heart. One of my favorite passages, and I know that I've already said that already, but one of my favorite passages is found in the passage that we read earlier from Hebrews chapter 12. It says in Hebrews 12, 6, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son he receives. One of the greatest evidences that you are a child of God is that you can't get away with sin in your life. That when you sin, you're brought to conviction. That when you run from him, that you're swallowed by a fish, metaphorically. And when you hide sin, he sends a Nathan into your life to expose it. It's not because he doesn't love you, it's because he does love you. There was a time in my life I felt like, man, why do these people get away with everything? I can't get away with anything. They slack off at work. If, If I slack off, I get in trouble. If I, if I say something unkind, I get called out for it. 
And I was so angry with God. And I remember one time, I, I, it was, came in so clear. I said, Lord, everybody gets away with nothing, but you don't let me get away with anything. He said, yes, that's because I love you. That's because I love you. And if you feel like you can't get, you know, you're going in the wrong direction and you trip over something, you fall on your face and you're embarrassed, guess what? It's because God loves you. And so God's heart for us is that he comes. It says in Ephesians that when we were far off that he came and he preached peace to us. God will, he will come for us. He will come for us. Listen, I'm of the the crowd that doesn't believe that you can lose your salvation. Maybe you disagree with me, that's okay. You can disagree with me and still go to heaven in the end, but I'm right. (laughs) And the reason is that is because that God is the one that holds my salvation. He's the one who holds me in his hand. And I know because I've stepped away from God before. I've walked away for a time, and guess what? He's come for me. We can trust in this faithful God. My salvation is not based upon me, and I do believe that we have a choice. We have choices in this life. But God loves us, and he will always come for us. And number two, what is his position towards the wayward believer? There is great celebration when the lost is found. You notice in the parable, and there are three in Luke chapter 15, two, we read this morning, one gets his own different uh, sermon, and, and you guys maybe will hear about that next week, but two of them, look what it says here in verse, says, he says, uh, it says, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep. And then when she loses the coin, she says, rejoice with me for I have found my coin. When the prodigal son returns, there's a great celebration. Listen, do you think that God who created man to have fellowship with him in the Garden of Eden. And that fellowship was broken because of sin and there was a separation between him and man. Would send his only son to come to earth to live a sinless life, to be rejected by his own people and to die one of the most gruesome death on the cross simply so that we can come to him and he would have a scowl on his face. Listen, our God loves us. And every time that we look into heaven and we look to our heavenly father, his heart beats faster. That he loves you, he loves you, he is for you. And when we come back to him from a life of disobedience or from a time of backsliding or from some sort of sin, yes, he might have a harsh rebuke as a father does. Yes, you might have a grown up spanking because he loves you, but he rejoices. That is the heart of our Father. Now, another passage that, that, is cherished, that I cherish is found in 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That is the heart of God. So many theologians, they get up and it's as if like, well, God, you know, raises up some just simply who, so he can show his wrath and that, what, that pleases him. But the heart of God is that all would come to repent, that all would come to know him. Now, n- not all will. That's a choice that they have. But his heart that, that, is that they would. I love that passage in Ezekiel where he says, do you think that I take pleasure in the death of the wicked? I don't. God would want everybody to find life, but because love is a choice, we have a choice, and many will not choose him. But his heart is that they would come to him. His heart is that we come back to him if we've fallen away. Now, what is repentance? Let's get into it now. What is the definition of repentance? Because I think that it's one of the words in the Bible that has kind of developed a negative connotation. We kind of picture a guy sitting on the street corner with a sandwich board and a bell and with no life in him saying like, repent or go to hell, you know, and you're like, okay, like there's truth in that, but like, I don't see the love of God in you. And we, or we think, you know, some well-meaning pastor who's, you know, screaming, repent, you know, and believe. And and we think that our God is angry at us. We think, oh, okay, I guess I got to repent and I failed so much and I just need to repent. Well, listen, the definition of repent is actually not a bad word for me. 
As a matter of fact, it's a glorious word. It's a word that tells me that I can be something different than who I am, than who I was born, when I was born in my sins. And listen, I messed up the first part of my life. I destroyed my mind in drugs and alcohol and pornography. So repentance for me means that I can be somebody different. I can look at my sisters in Christ and love them the way that God sees them. Repentance by definition means a change of mind. It means a change of mind. Now, a lot of pastors and preachers, they will tack on to that and say, it's a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. And I do believe that that is true. But I believe that if we have a change of mind, we will have a change of direction. I want to give you guys a little bit of a illustration of what I think repentance could, could look like. Um, it's a bit silly, but sometimes in Christianity, it's, it's good to make things simple. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus taught the parables so that the commoner can know the, the simplicity of very complex theology. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an illustration. You imagine if I go to my friend Reuven and listen, I can listen to this guy talk all day. I'm trying to talk him into like, you know, uh, recording through the Bible, like a, a, so I could just listen to his voice all day long. But I go to my friend Reuven and I say, you know, Reuven, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. It seems like I'm, I'm sick all the time in different things. You know, I have a cold one month, the next month I have the flu, you know, I break out in hives sometimes twice a month. I mean, I'm always sick. What is going on? And Reuven, who loves intensely, would say, you know, Matt, I'm not a doctor, but listen, I'll follow you around and I'll find out what's going on in your life and what, maybe we can get to the bottom of this. And so Reuven follows me around and he notices something that when I come to a door, instead of opening the door with my hand, I open the door with my mouth. <laughs> I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, so don't pick up rocks just yet. So I open the door with my mouth, and he takes me aside and he says, okay, look, Matt, <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but I think I know what your problem is. You open the door with your mouth. Do you know how many germs and weird things are on you know, the, the door handle? Stop doing that and maybe you won't be sick anymore. <laughs> and I say, okay, you know what, Brother Reuben, I know that you love me, I take your advice, I don't want to be sick anymore, so I'm not going to open up doors with my mouth anymore. And he says, okay, <laughs> Brother Matt, it's good that you took my advice, I see that you see the air of your way, you don't want to get sick anymore, but there's something else you need to know. Opening up doors with your mouth is weird. <laughs> okay, listen. We don't repent simply because of the consequences of our sin. We repent because we see that sin is weird. I mean, can you imagine the angels looking at our life and seeing some of the weird things that we do? Some of the dark things that we do. One of the greatest, ass, uh, one of the greatest um, assets of the Holy Spirit is that he reveals to us that sin is wrong. I can't remember which pastor said it first, but he said that sin isn't bad because it's forbidden, but it's forbidden because it's bad. And so sometimes we just need to see the darkness of it and say, okay, that, that is gross. I don't want to do that anymore. And it's the regenerational work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And so repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. There's two more things that I want to mention about repentance, and that is God's part, God's work of repentance in our life. You notice in the scripture reading that we read earlier, it's when the woman loses the coin, it says that she lights a lamp, okay, so she can see, and she begins to clean around the area where the, the coin was lost. And so there's two things, one, light, two, the, different, the, the difference between clean and unclean, okay? Let's talk about the first one, light. Number one, God, God will shine light into dark areas of our life. He'll shine light into dark areas of our life. 
When I lived in California, uh, I worked for um, a very prestigious restaurant in Orange County, California. It was the kind where you walk in and see the menu and you're a bit offended by the prices. It was the kind where so many guests would say, well, what does this $70 steak come with? And I say, sir, it comes with a plate. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> but in this restaurant, we would do something that was very interesting. We would turn down the lights until it was almost completely dark. And we'd serve them wine. And we would call that romantic. Why would we call that romantic? Why is dim, a dim light romantic? It's because we all look good in the dark, don't we? Yeah. Now, some of you who are much younger and better looking, uh, you don't have that problem. But as you get older, you see the wrinkles and you see the gray hair. My biggest problem is when the lights come on. Listen, I look great in the dark. <laughs> My problem is the light. So we're walking along in our Christianity and like, man, I'm doing pretty good in life. And then God shines something in our life and we're like, I, I am not doing well. And listen, it doesn't have to be the quintessential sex drugs and rock and roll. You could steal cookies out of grandma's jar and be under conviction of it. There, there is something about when God shines the light into our life, we come under conviction, we see the ugliness of what it really is, and we are brought to confession to God. So let God shine light into your your lives. You know, it says, in, and everybody knows John 3.16, but how many times do we see John 3.19 on a coffee mug or a t-shirt? It says, this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, but man preferred darkness because their deeds were evil. Brothers and sisters, we need to walk in the light. And when we walk in the light, he's faithful to cleanse us and forgive us for what he exposes. On the other hand, in Romans, it says that they, the, the, the wicked, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They push it out. It's the child of God that will walk in the light, and as uncomfortable as it is, that's what brings us to Christ, and the, the, it shows us the need for a Savior. And so number two, number two is the distinction between clean and unclean. Now, what does that mean? Because we can all make a definition like, oh, well, this is clean and that's unclean. Everybody thinks that they have, the, you know, the monopoly on what is right or wrong. But what, is, what does God think? That's the real question. I'm going to give you a, another illustration to help you understand the difference between knowing if you're clean and if you're unclean. This last week, uh, we, my students and I, we traveled down to the Dead Sea. Now, if you've been to the Dead Sea, there's only two things you really do in the Dead Sea. Number one is you float. You go into the Dead Sea, you can read a book, you can get a suntan, whatever it is, but you just float on that water. And number two is what? Mud. You can put mud all over your, your body and take pictures, and it's kind of fun. And supposedly it's, it's good for you, it's good for your skin. So you, you can put mud all over your body. And so let's just say that we're down there, I'm there with my students, and we're putting mud all over ourselves, and you know, being a, an honorary pastor, you know, I decide to have a mud fight. And I'm throwing mud at everybody, and I'm the only one laughing because, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> it's funny to me. <laughs> Now, are, are they going to be mad? Other than knowing that I'm just a, a bit silly and maybe a little bit foolish, are they going to be mad at me? No. The reason is because they, they're already dirty. So I can throw mud, and if you're already dirty, guess what? You're not going to be mad. Now, I've asked our, our students, our girls, uh, most of them are young in their early 20s. Most of them want to get married. And I say, hey, listen, ladies, I want to ask you a question. Imagine it's your wedding day, okay? And you spend weeks preparing, weeks getting your hair done and makeup and nails. I mean, you look absolutely gorgeous, pristine. And you walk through those doors and for some reason, you've asked me to officiate the wedding. And I'm standing up here, everybody stands, the bride is coming in. The music is playing, people are looking at you, the angels are singing, this is your moment. You are beautiful, you are set to go, you're coming down the aisle, and all of a sudden, I reach behind me, 
as an honorary pastor that I am, and I pull out a jar of Dead Sea mud. Now I want to submit to you that if I, if I would act on my impulse, it would take an army of men to pull her off of me. Why? Because she's been washed, and she's been cleansed, and she's getting ready for the bridegroom. Now saints, you have been washed, you have been cleansed, you are the bride of Christ. And when God comes in, he does a supernatural work that he does, he cleanses us. There's something, we come out of that and we're like, look, I, I know that I can sin, I know that I have the flesh, it's warring against me, but listen, I've been cleansed by Christ and I don't want that. And we can resist temptation simply because that we don't want to be, we don't ha want to have that spot on us. And if you don't mind the dirt, and if you don't mind the things of this world, then listen, maybe there's just areas in your life that need to be cleansed. And it's not something theoretical, hypothetical. It's something that God really does in our life. He cleanses us. And it's an inner working of Christ. I want to ask you one more thing before I close. How can God be righteous? And how can God be merciful at the same time? You ever thought about that? Why did God have to send Jesus to die on the cross? Why couldn't God just show us his mercy and say, oh, listen, I'm a merciful God, I forgive you. We all look back on King David and we think like, wow, what? a man after God's own heart. He came, you know, he was broken. God forgave him and we all stand up and clap. But what about Bathsheba's family? What about Uriah's family? You ever thought about that justice? I remember being in a conversation with a Muslim man and I gave him kind of an illustration. We're going back and forth as far as religion and you know, Islam and Christianity, and there's something that stood out to me. They said, look, you know, all arguments aside, let me tell you why I put my faith in Jesus. Why it's just not just something that I grew up with or I heard a preacher and I was convinced and I became a Christian or a cultural Christian. Let me tell you why I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And I gave him an illustration. And Listen, a lot of these things come out of studying apologetics or he things I hear in sermons, but it's a real conversation. And I said, listen, is God just? Is he just? Does he make perfect decisions? And he says, yes, of course. Allah is just. He's, he's a perfect judge. Everything he does is good. And he said, okay, I believe that. We, we believe that God is just. He said, is God merciful? He said, of course. The Quran says that God is merciful. And maybe, you know, one day if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, you know, I, I'll get to go to paradise. And I said, well, there's your problem. He says, what do you mean, what my problem? I said, God cannot be just and merciful at the same time. And he says, what are you talking about? Of course he can, that's what it says. And he says, well, let me give you an illustration. Let me tell you why. I said, imagine you, you're a man, you start working at 15, 16 years old, working in your father's, shop, your, your father's shop, and you save up money. You save up money for a house. You save up money for a wedding. And you spend your whole life putting away money until you're 65, 70 years old, and now you have enough money to retire. Maybe you have a million shekels in a bank. Like you have spent your whole life working, and now you're, willing, now you're ready to rest. But somebody steals that money. All of your life savings is gone in a second. And you're broken and you have nothing to show for your, your life's labor. It says, but they catch the guy. The police bring him in. A couple months later, he shows up to court. They lay, lay out all of the evidence. The video shows that you broke in, you stole the money. We know that it was you. And the judge gets up and says, listen, you are absolutely guilty, but guess what? I'm a merciful judge. I say you go home. Do you see the problem? And I said, you probably would hate that judge more than the person that stole your money because he's an unjust judge. Why do I pay, put my faith in Jesus? It's because he actually paid the price for my sins. 
And that way he can become the just and the justifier of sinful man. We must have a sacrifice when it comes to sin. My atheist friends, they come to me and say, you know, Matt, don't you know how many religions there are in the world? I say, yeah, there's like 4,200 and some odd religions. But let me tell you something, there's only really two religions in the world. The religion that says that man needs to do and have their best efforts to get to heaven, something that never works out. And then there's Christianity, God's way of getting to man, the death of his own son. There has never been one propitiation in all of history, and there never will be, of the person of Jesus Christ who paid for the sins of the world. Why can he forgive David? Why can he forgive us? It's because Jesus Christ paid for those sins. You know, there was a young man that came to a preacher once, and he asked a question. He says, how can one man die for the sins of the entirety of the human race? And he says, young man, uh, I thank you for that question. It's my favorite question. Now, in my mind, I think theologically, one man's sin brought sin into the world. And just as one man's obedience by going to the cross can bring life to many. But I love what the preacher said. He says, look, you asked me, how can one man die for the sins of all humanity from the beginning of time? And he says, because that man was worth more than all of them put together. And he says, if you take a scale and on one side of the scale, you put in everything that was ever created from the beginning of time, from you know, the solar system and uni the universe and people and babies and love and joy and everything, and you put it on one side of the scale and you put Jesus Christ on the other side of the scale, he will outweigh them all in his worth. How many sins did it take for death to come into the world? Just one. Sometimes we drink it down like water. God sent his only son to become a man, to live as a pauper, to be rejected, beaten, hung on the cross, and to die for your sins and my sins. And that's a God that I will worship for all of eternity. And sometimes I don't even think that we know this so great a salvation as what the book of Hebrews calls it. Let us worship God today for what he's done. Man fails, but God does not fail. We sometimes are faithless, but he is always faithful. We fall, but he comes for us. And whatever sin that we committed is under the blood of Jesus Christ. And all that it takes is coming to him, confessing, repenting, having a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we have these examples in the Bible. We thank you that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. We thank, Lord, that we can read this and see that you redeem even those who fall. And we pray like that tonight, Lord, that we can just come before you and have that open door, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. We can come and make things right, Lord. And I pray that you would reveal your heart to us tonight, that you, can, you would show us that you love us and that you would show us that you're not done with us, God. So, Lord, draw us close to you. Wash us and cleanse us. And help us, Lord, to walk with you all the days of our life. And we say this in the name of Jesus. Amen.